missed you folks. Uh, for those of you who've listened to me last while I was on Dove, you know that I just uh, uh, concluded a 40-day liquid fast. Now that's right, liquid only, no foods at all. And uh, once I would have completed that, I took me some R&R &R and I had some other stuff to deal with, hence you didn't hear me on the radio. However, I was still doing teachings via my, from my home. So those of you who've been following me, you know exactly what I've been keeping up with. Many of you have been writing me and asking me uh, many things about the fast. I did a seven part series on encouragement during your time of fasting. That was the title of it. If you would go on YouTube or Facebook and type that in by Minister Kevin L. A. Ewing, we'll pull up all the parts to it. And I'm basically taking you on my journey and uh, you know the, the, the spiritual uh, things that you need to engage and the precise way in which we should uh, engage a fast. My fast was extremely successful. In fact, I started seeing results of that fast even before I concluded it, all right? And right now, I am in easy mode, I'm relaxed because the big tickets or the bigger fish that I was frying earlier, <laughs> so to speak, I know that those things would most certainly come to pass. I wanna thank God most of all, because I did pray for the endurance from him and not to be, uh, you know, bombarded with headaches and hunger pains and all. I had none of that. None of that I had. Uh, the first two weeks, uh, everything went, this was the best fast I've ever had. It was very, very focused, very, very determined. Uh, every morning I would get up, my first drink would be a, a lemon, a whole lemon squeeze mixed with water. I mean, it all depends on the morning, what I would do. I would either do that or mix it with the... Uh, the uh, virgin cold press olive oil, a teaspoonful of that with the lemon and water. Or I would do that, like I told you, the lemon, the water, the, uh, the uh, olive oil, and the raw honey. I would mix that, that would give me my boost of energy. And from there, I will then go proceed with a 3.2 mile walk, which is not too far from me, nice quiet area. I would do that every other morning in terms of the walk. Throughout the day, I would have me the 100% pure, uh, unsweetened grapefruit juice mixed with a lot of water and ice. I would do that. And I would also have the pomegranate, Pamo, Pamo I think it is, 100% pomegranate. Now, it got a little, not too pleasant taste. Again, mix it with a lot of water because you want to make sure you're hydrated, but not so much of the juices, but uh, particularly of water. I would encourage you, if possible, that during that time of fasting, if you could literally, in terms of water, use the alkaline water, because that's what I use. Use the alkaline water. And the encouragement from that fast, other than, aside from the spiritual aspect of it, which is a given, the health benefits are tremendous. Uh, those of you who've been listening, you know, I lost a total of 44 pounds. I just got tired of looking like an upside down Christmas tree. So I decided, I decided that I'm gonna lose this weight. And I blame Deidre, I can be honest with you, okay? I can blame her because she never told me. She always tell me, honey, you look cute, liar. You know I didn't look no cute, I have people laughing at me. That's all right though. You can ask me to buy you something for Christmas and we can see who look cute then. But anyway, I ain't gonna go to the day. <laughs> nevertheless, nevertheless, I am so thankful that I was able to drop 44 pounds. Since then, like I said, I had to I had to travel because I had to now change my entire wardrobe. I gave away every piece of clothes that I had because none of them could fit me anymore. And uh, when I went over to Florida, and I was wearing a size 40 in my waist. Now, you know, I know when you all see me on this video and stuff, you're like, no, man, Kevin, you couldn't have been that big. And I agree with you. But according to these pants size, say size 40, so I had to go with that. So when I put on my first, uh, when I tried my first pants over there, I... At present right now, I'm a size 34 in waist. Can you imagine that? Slim Jim, that's what Deidre called me now. So I say, see there, I catch you. You're calling me Slim. Why didn't you call me Slim Jim two months ago? Anyway, we ain't gonna go there. <laughs> so anyway, I'm the 34, and now I'm not to no 3X large. I'm at extra large. And of course, I'm maintaining that because I have uh, did a regimen 
where I consume more greens and vegetables. And of course, I do my own cooking. And people were surprised of that because I cooked during my time of fasting, where I have no desire for the food. I cook for Deidre and our families and so on and share it out. And all that was a part of my fasting. And I know it's very difficult for most people, but I did it. And for me, it's some kind of therapy. I like doing it. So I did that. And now that I'm not on the fast anymore, I've increased my running now to from from 3.2 miles to 5 miles just about every morning or every other morning that I would do that now, <clears throat> okay? Uh, I'm really doing everything within my part to maintain my body in terms of keeping it fit and keeping it right and putting in the right stuff. Uh, I Well, the juices and, and, and sodas and stuff, I always had cut that out a long time ago, so that wasn't nothing for me. I, I've cut out my coffee, and if I do drink it now, it's without the sugar. So what I'm doing now is avoiding sugar altogether. And if I purchase any form of juice, and once I read that label, and if it have any form of sugar in it, then I would most definitely dilute it with water tremendously, especially with the sodium and all this stuff. Now, the good thing about it, I didn't have any health issues other than the back pain prior to all of this. So I decided with the fast as an encouragement to be proactive as opposed to uh, waiting for something to happen, you know. No, no, no. So I want to encourage all of those out there because I know I've encouraged a lot of you with the fast, especially when you saw the the weight loss and the testimonies are, are on its way, believe me, in terms of the spiritual aspect of it. I want to encourage you, like I've been teaching and preaching to you as it relates to fasting. You have to be disciplined. You have to deal with your heart. That is key. You are wasting time going on a fast when you are filled with hate and bitterness and unforgiveness and pride and you got it in for people for 400 years. You, you're not going on a fast. What you are on is a uh, weight loss program, but definitely not a fast, all right? Your heart has to be right. You have to follow the right protocols for fasting. Genuine fasting, as I would have detailed in my teaching according to Isaiah 58, you must initiate that fast by giving to the less fortunate, giving the naked, feeding the hungry, giving those who are thirsty something to drink, or read it, it's all in there. And during this fast, the Lord has released this, this powerful revelation to me as it relates to generational curses, what I'll be talking about today. And my mission is to go into deeper depths as it relates to the reality of generational curses. And, and where we're going today is going to be profound, all right? I want to thank God for the St. Paul's Methodist Church. Now, this is interesting because... Uh, Week before last, I was in Florida. I decided to take a week, my, a week off to just relax myself after the fast. And like I say, shop for some new clothing and so on, right? And <clears throat> we got to Florida that Sunday. So uh, Saturday, sorry, sorry, uh, Monday. So I'm kicking back, you know, did some nice breakfast and getting ready to watch at least two episodes of Scooby doing some Tom and Jerry, right? <laughs> so I got this email. And with that email, also, I got a, a, a WhatsApp from uh, uh, Miss, Miss Carla Knowles, right, Miss Carla Knowles, asking me if uh, I would accept the invitation uh, to be their guest speaker to their 53rd church anniversary, which is Sunday Pass. Now, what Miss Knowles did not know was that during the time of fasting, I was really praying and seeking God and asking him to create more avenues for me to teach this, these messages that he's given me to our people, our Bahamian people, because I have countless invitations all over the world, literally. Some of them I turned down, and a lot of them were working out to see how I could fit it in now. And I said, our people need to know about these things. They need to understand the spiritual aspect of generational curses and how it's dictating the course of their lives today. Even though they are safe, this is one of the main blockages as to why they're not getting ahead. So when she called and offered the, the, the invitation, I, I told DJ, I said, man, listen, this, this God right here, the, the, the door's already opening. So I ha before I called, I had DJ call to see if we could uh, have our flight to leave earlier. We were supposed to leave the following Sunday, but uh, 
we decided to leave that Friday, so I'll be here for the service on Sunday pass. Anyway, everything was like clockwork. Everything turned out right. I gave a call, tell her we'll be able to do it, blah, blah, blah. And listen, we had an awesome, awesome time speaking on generational curses on Sunday pass. And our topic was who planted these seeds? These seeds that are harvesting today, where did it come from? We're all saved. We're all calling on Jesus. Why is all this tragedy and backwardness and limitations in our lives? Why are children on drugs and, 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 and having this uh, fetish about the same sex? Wh wh where did this come from? And I took my time with the help of the Holy Spirit to really bring clarity and break it down via scripture as usual, showing the, 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 the trend and taking him back in the family bloodline to bring the evidence as to why these things are happening. It was a blessed service. Uh, they treated my wife and I very well, very, very well. I want to thank uh, Reverend uh, Kenneth Lewis, uh, his excellent host, his entire, uh, all his members, all the officers, everyone treated us well. And I want to thank God for that opportunity that was granted me. And I see the hand of God uh, uh, displayed there. I know many. The word of God was planted deep into the crevices of the hearts of those people. And now they have an understanding of what, why are these negative things happening, even though they are believers. So I'm going to quickly go through my teaching, to, sorry, my sponsors, because we have a very, very powerful, I'm talking, listen, let me tell you right now, get somebody right now, get your friend, call your enemy, call your, your cousin, who you ain't talked to in two years now, tell him, now listen, I can put my not talking to you on pause right now for at least two hours, but listen to this boy voice now. Now you can act fool all you want after that, but just listen to this for two hours. We need to understand the sexual perversion via generational curses. That's what we're talking about today. We're talking about the incest. We're talking about uh, uh, homosexuality. All of this we're going to show that these things didn't pop up when it was demonstrated in our cousin and our niece and our sister and our brother, okay? This this uh, having multiple partners and no, 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 no. That didn't just happen when you saw it or when you decide to recognize it. I am going to meticulously take you, listen, through the scriptures and show you these patterns and show you where if you want to truly understand why these results are so consistent in the family negatively, then we need to go back in the past. We need to do a, an introspect of what has happened in the past to get an understanding. Because if you don't, if you don't, what you don't address, I want you to write this down, will undress you. Very simple. Tico's Fashion Men's Stores for all of your casual men needs. They're located downtown, uh, uh, across the street from the post office, diagonally across the street from Scotia Bank. The number is 352-3394, 352-3394, where Mr. Gary Hill and his wonderful family will be happy to assist you in any form of casual wear for your cousin, your uncle, your father, grandfather, your nephew, whomever. They have an array of beautiful, beautiful clothing. That's where I get my stuff from. If you want to look uh, uh, top-notch, when you're out there, whether you're on a date, whether you want to, whatever it is, visit Tico's Fashion Men's Store. The number again is 352-3394. That's 352-3394. Entertainment, DVD, and Snack. Located Town Center. Their number is 352-6954. 352-6954 for all of your delicious hot dogs. Variety of patties such as beef, jerk, Curry chicken, cheesy beef, spinach, vegetables, patties, all of them. They also have an assortment of DVD movies, snacks, soft drinks, you name it. So get, pay them a visit right now. If you have difficulty finding them, finding them in the town set area, then you can give them a call and they'll direct you there. 352-6954, where Mr. Tony and Mistress Angela Penniman and their awesome staff, again, will be more than happy to assist you. The number again is 352-6954. Pick Here Beauty Center, also located town center, where the proprietor is Mrs. Marcia Pickstock, where her and her crew specialize in hair care and wraps, bonding, short pixie, haircut, hair weaving, ponytail, sculptured styles, you name it. If they don't know it, then they will, they will fix it up for you, however you want to fix Give Marcy and a crew a, a pay them a visit at Pick Here Beauty 
Center. Again, they're located at Town Center. If you have difficulty finding them, you can give them a call at the office at 352-2220. 352-2220. Or you can give a call on her cell phone, which is 533-9326. 533-9326. Bahamas Beach Weddings, my good friend, Reverend Gary Cooper, for all of your wedding needs especially my international crew. If you want to come into the Bahamas where we have sun, sun, and sea, and you want to have a beautiful background for all of your wedding needs, or even our locals, then give Reverend Gary Cooper. He's also a justice of the peace and also a marriage officer. And you can locate him at 53, well, let me give you the, the, the prefix, 242 for the international folks, 242-533-1942. 242 -533 his email is C Gary, that's C G A R Y, okay, 473 at gmail.com. C G A R Y 473 at gmail.com. You can also visit him on his website, which is Bahamas Beach Weddings with an S dot biz, B I Z. That's Bahamas Beach Weddings dot biz. And to put the icing on the cape, it is free consultation for all weddings, okay? So if you plan to be married, please give Reverend Cooper a call, Reverend Gary Cooper, 533-1942, area code 242-533-1942. And again, all consultation as it relates to arranging your wedding and scheduling it is all free, all right? That one will be on the house. Simply the best for all of your multimedia needs audio, video, private weddings, funerals, streaming from churches, funerals, whatever, because of all of the uh, uh, pandemic rules and regulations, well, Simply the Best has adjusted themselves to meet the needs of the customers, okay? So if you want to stream that funeral that those family members from England and Canada and Mozambique cannot come here to the Bahamas too, then we can stream it online. Give them a call at 727-1502, 727-1502, simply the best for all of your multimedia needs, private weddings, church functions, uh, work parties, you name it. Give Mr. Clifford Bo a call at 727-1502, JAN Builders General Construction Company. For all of your building and construction needs, you want to build a home, you want to add a piece on, you want to refurbish. Whatever it is, you want to kick that lazy boy out of your house and build his own house, get him from around there. So give them a call at 352-2432, 352-2432, or if you need to reach them expeditiously, then you can give them a call on their mobile at 533-2064. That's JN Builders General Construction Company, where Mr. Julian and Karen Nixon will help you with whatever it is that you are planning to construct. Then we have here Rondi Shoeverse, our newest addition as it relates to shoes in this beautiful island of Grand Bahama, Rondi Shoeverse, located at number 9 Forest Avenue. And their number, in case you have difficulty finding them, is 602 7546. 602 7546. Nice children's shoes, females, males, adults, you name them. They got it all there. Slippers, casual wear, uh, formal wear, they got it all there. Even for y'all who got a bunch of old bunion and corner on your foot, they could squeeze them in those shoes too. So you come down there to run the shoe the voice, all right? They ain't gonna poke fun at you. They're gonna come there and squeeze that same twist of foot straight in those shoes. <laughs> and I'm sure y'all will love those shoes. As run the shoe universe, again, their number is 602. 7546, they're located at number 9, Forest Avenue. I want to thank everybody. As you would have known, we would have adopted the Freeport Primary School, the uh, Kevin L. Ewing Spiritual Insight Show. And we're going to have them back on very soon to update you with some excellent news. Excellent news. Everybody is happy because, listen, things. I want to thank everybody locally as well as internationally who has truly answered the call to meeting the needs of others. Clearly, the teachings that I've been teaching on this has really touched your heart. And many of you have written me with so much and tremendous testimonies on the benefits 
of giving to those who are less fortunate. I want to thank every one of you that have donated in every which way, books, monetarily, you name it, you've done it. And you've really brought a smile to not just the faces of the children, but you've taken a lot of pressure, especially off of their families, who during this time of pandemic and job losses or being on furlough and all this other stuff, God has sent you now to, to meet them uh, where they are. So I want to thank every last one of you right now for all of your, your, your contributions and everything that you have done. If you want to continue, uh, the number is 438-7595. Of those internationally, the number uh, area code is 242-438-7595. All right. Now, before I uh, do my last advertisement, I want to send a special shout out here. All right. Okay. Now, this is a teacher's aide. Her name is Samantha Roberts. All right. Samantha Roberts had advised my wife. Okay. Say, so please tell your husband that my mom, Miss Beverly Roberts, <laughs> that's right. Miss Beverly Roberts is always referencing your husband's teaching every day of Samantha's life. <laughs> okay. Samantha says she's had enough of it. All right. Please inform Miss Dewing. And so what I'm going to do right now is send a super special shout out to one of my greatest supporters in the person of Mrs. Beverly Roberts. I'm going to thank you for tuning in and listening to the word of God and allowing the word of God, not Kevin, but the word of God to penetrate your heart, to make the necessary changes, to be in alignment with God. Samantha Roberts, I want to thank you, okay, uh, for taking... Uh, quote unquote the uh, the verbal abuse in terms of listening to my name being called on time. But we thank God for both of the people, Samantha Roberts as well as, as well as her mom Beverly Roberts. And we pray that they will bless you. And through your application of the word of God, you like everybody else who's committed to the word of God, whose confidence is in the word of God, will see the promises of the word of God. Because he's a God that cannot lie. He says, let every man be a liar, but let you, O God, be through it true. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but not one tittle of his word shall pass. And as usual, I left here for last. My good friend here, all the way from Nassau, Bahamas, Miss Curry Williams, Jillian Curry Williams. And I got to put this in my screen right here. For those of you who are watching me live right now via Facebook, via Twitter, via YouTube, the one and only, okay, the elegant, our own fashion designer, author, you name it. She wear many hats, but this is her magazine called The Hope Magazine. I encourage you, as usual, to go to uh, Amazon.com and order your copy of The Hope Magazine, where they are awesome, and encouraging, and inspiring and uplifting many articles in there as long as a lot of her designs and, and many other stuff that you would find in there. So please uh, support, especially us here in the Bahamas. This is our own Lagerfeld and Chanel. Forget all them. We talking about Miss Curry today, all right? Ms. Sorry, Miss Curry Williams. And I want to also thank her husband, Mr. Franklin Williams, who supports his wife and he's behind her 100%. And we thank God for them. And we pray that they will continue to be blessed in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. I want to thank everyone that supports my ministry, that see what I'm doing here in terms of getting the unadulterated truth to the people of God to dismantle, to destroy every form or anything that even look like similar to tradition. We're not interested in tradition because there's no scripture that tells us if we follow tradition, we will go to heaven. No, there's no scripture that tells us if we follow tradition, God is going to bless us. No. So what is it that we want, Mr. Ewing? We want what the scripture says. We don't want what no man say. We don't want nobody's opinion. We don't want no church policy. We don't want how someone feel or what they think or it is their feeling. No, feelings get people straight in hellfire. We don't want to be a part of hellfire. So in order to, to, to not participate in the events in hell, then we must do it God's way. A lot of people don't like it because they love their way. We're not interested in them because scriptures is very clear. Proverbs 16 verse 25, there is a way that may appear unto us to be right. But at the end of that way, 
you are guaranteed, it's a prophecy, it's, you are guaranteed death or even destruction. However, according to Proverbs 19 verse 21, it says that even though there are many devices or ideas in a man's heart, but only which God has counseled himself on concerning us shall prevail. So with that said, Father, let that and only that which you have counseled yourself on concerning our lives, let that and that alone come to fruition. Any other junk, let it be tossed straight in the bush, buried in the garbage where it belongs. Only thing I want to see happening in my life is what God has ordained before the foundation of the world. He is God, not me. I am his child. I want to do exactly what he says. So today, let's get to today. Boy, you all don't know how I couldn't wait to get here. Today, like I told you, the Lord has instructed me even before my fasting, even before my fasting, more so during the time of my fasting. Once you come off this fast, young man, I want you to deal intensely with generational curses. Many, many, many people are bound. The, the power of a generational curse is the ignorance of the victim. That's number one. And what you're about to see today, because our topic today is generational curses, sexual perversion through generational curses. And my, my whole aim today, I'm going to take my time today, and I hope you have your pen, I hope you have your writing pads or papers, because I'm going to, everything that I tell you, I'm going to give you the scriptures. The purpose of that, like with all of my teaching, I don't teach opinion. I don't teach how I feel. I don't teach how I think it should be. I don't twist, alter change, augment scripture. Exactly what I'm reading, I'm going to break it down to you. The Lord has given me a very, very powerful nugget as it relates to breaking these things. I released that nugget during my teachings, uh, uh, during my fast. I've released it with the, with the, with the folks at the uh, St. Paul's Methodist Church last week, and I will continue to release this, where when you go on the genuine fast, according to Isaiah 15 verse 12, you have literally been spiritually deputized to become the curse breaker of your bloodline. But we can get into that later on down in this particular teaching, all right? So, again, our topic is general, sorry, sexual perversion, sexual perversion via generational curses. And what I decided to do today is pick a character from the Bible, and we're going to do an expose on his life. Because I want to show you through this man's particular bloodline how the curse, the generational curse of sexual perversion had spread its tentacles throughout the future generation of this one man. But because folks were ignorant of the spiritual implication of what this man did physically, nobody understood the rules, the laws, the principles. As a result of that, it was like someone threw a net over the family and, and, and literally subdue them and limit them and cause them to be uh, uh, committed to an evil sexual way of living. It wasn't that they wanted to do it. They had no other choice because of the spiritual implication imposed on them as a result of what the forefathers did. So this man that we're going to talk about today, his name is Judah, J-U-D-A-H, okay? And Judah was the fourth son of Leah and Jacob. As you would have recalled, Jacob married two sisters, all right? Originally, he was supposed to marry, uh, I think her name was Rachel, right? Yeah, Rachel, I believe that's her name. Yeah, anyway, he was tricky and up marrying the other sister, Leah. Bottom line is, his first set of children was with Leah. That would have been Reuben, Levi, Reuben, Levi, Simeon, and then Judah, all right? Now, I'm not going to go into the life of Reuben, and I'm not going to go into the life of Simeon and Levi. When I continue with the generational curses, I'm going to pick them specifically because I'm going to show you deeper the generational curses that came along with, that, with them, specifically as it relates to the generational curse of rejection because of their father neglecting them, because of their father disdain for their mother Leah, it was also transferred to the children. So because he rejected them, it not only built bitterness in the children, but that spirit of rejection spiritually came in there based on the father showing absolutely no love for Leah's children, whom Leah he despised. 
But we ain't gonna go there today. We can deal with that during these series of generational curses. So what we wanna deal with today is Judah. And I want you to write these two scriptures down, all right? Genesis chapter 29, verse 35, because this is now gonna speak of uh, Judah being the fourth child of Leah, of Jacob and Leah. So Genesis chapter 29, Genesis chapter 29, verse 35. And then we're going to go to Genesis 35 and verse 23. Genesis 35 and verse 23, all right? Now I'm going to read Genesis 35 verse 23, but Genesis 29 verse 35, you can write that down because I just want to give you the scriptures to support everything that I'm saying here, okay? So in Genesis chapter 29, hold on, let me just put this up here a second. So in Genesis chapter 35, verse 23, it says, The sons of Leah, which was Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, Simeon, and Levi, and Judah, which was the fourth one. And of course, Issachar and Zebulun, right? But it's Judah that we're going to be focusing on here. All right? Now, if we go to Genesis 38, okay, I'm going to read the entire chapter, because we want to see some stuff about this guy, Judah. Okay? Now watch this. This is chapter 38, beginning at verse 1. And it came to pass at the time that Judah went down from his brethren and turned into a certain Adullamite whose name was Hera. And Judah saw there a daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shoah. And he took her and went in unto her, or he had intercourse with her. And she conceived and bare a son, and he called his name Er. And she conceived again, and bare a son, and she called his name Onan. And she yet again conceived, and bare a son, and called his name Shelah. And he was at, at Chizip when she bare him. And Judah took a wife for Er, his firstborn, whose name was Tamar. Okay? And Er, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord slew him or killed him. Verse 8 of Genesis 38. And Judah said unto Onan, Go in unto thy brother's wife, and marry her, and raise up seed to thy brother. So let me just explain this to you. The Jewish custom was that if one of the sons was married, particularly the oldest one, and he died before having children, then the custom was that the next son in line is to marry his wife. But the catch is, whatever children that they produce would not be the children of the son who took the place of the deceased son. According to scripture, these children will now be the son of the, de de the deceased brother, which I think is crazy. So clearly Onan had a problem with this, all right? So back to verse 8 of Genesis 38 says, And Judah said unto Onan, Go in unto thy brother's wife, and marry her, and raise up seed to thy brother. And Onan knew that the seed, or the children here, should not be his. And it came to pass, when he went in unto his brother's wife, or when he had intercourse with her, that he spilled it on the ground, lest that he should give seed to his brother. So in other words, during the time of intercourse, he would draw so that he would not impregnate Tamar. Well, according to verse uh, 10, it says, And the thing which he did displeased the Lord, wherefore he slew him, and God killed him for doing this. Now, that's a whole new teaching in and of itself, but we ain't going to go to the day. So verse 11 of, of Genesis 38 says, Then said Judah to Tamar, Tamar being his daughter-in-law, Remain a widow, at thy father's house, till Sheila, my son, be grown. So the deal is, Judah now is kind of skeptical here, look like woman. Anything you put your hand on, they just is fall land dead around here. So he says, I only got three sons, two of them done dead now, okay? Both were married to you. Now, Sheila, my youngest son, what we're going to do here is you go by your power house. You stay a widow, don't marry nobody, until Sheila gets old, in Sheila becomes old enough, Sheila being a man here. And then, you know, we will try to work something out. So in verse 11, it says, Then said Judah to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, Remain a widow at thy father's house, till Sheila my son be grown. 
For he said, least suppose or pre-adventure he die also, as his brethren did. And Tamar went and dwelt in her father's house, just like uh, you would have told her. And verse 12 of Genesis 38. And in process of time, the daughter of Shua, Judah's wife, died. And Judah was comforted and went up unto his sheep's, his sheep shirts to Timnath, he and his friend Hira the Adolamite. Verse 13 of Genesis 38. And it was told Tamar, remember who Tamar is now, Tamar is the daughter-in-law to Judah. Tamar was married to two of Judah's sons, which would have been Ur and Onan, who are now deceased. So in verse 13 of Genesis 38 says, And it was told Tamar, saying, Behold, thy father-in-law, which is Judah, goeth up to Timnath to share his sheep. And she put her widow's garment off, or she took it off from her, and covered her with a veil, and wrapped herself, and sat in an open place, which is by the way to Timnath. For she saw that Sheila was grown, and she was not given unto him to wife. So she realized now that her father-in-law pulled a fast one on her, all right? Because he promised her, when Sheila gets older now, I can now hook you all two up. You could now marry him. And again, that's the custom. She realized now that Judah lied. Sheila's a big grown man now. And ain't nobody get back to her. So now what she did is she decided to dress in a harlot's outfit with the intent to now sleep with her father-in-law. And this is where the seeds are about to be planted. That's as I'm about to teach you today, that's going to change the destiny of the future generation. My Lord, this is just too juicy. This is just too juicy. So listen to this now. Let's go back to verse 14. And she, which is, is Tamar, put her widow's garment from her and covered her with a veil and wrapped herself and sat in an open place, which is, by the way, to Timnath. For she saw that Sheila was grown, and she was not given unto him to wife. When Judah saw her, he brought her to be a harlot because she had covered her face. So he didn't recognize that this was his daughter-in-law. Because the way she was dressed and her face was covered, he just figured he just is going to sleep <coughs> with this prostitute. Excuse me. He's going to sleep with this prostitute, right? So verse 16 of Genesis 38 says, When Judah saw her, he brought her to be a harlot. Verse 15, sorry. Because she had covered her face. Verse 16 says, And he turned unto her by the way and said, Go to, I pray thee, let me come in unto thee. For he knew not that she was his daughter-in-law. So he's, big, he's basically requiring intercourse from her. And she said, what will thou give me that thou mayest come unto me? What would you give me for sleeping with you then? Verse 17 of Genesis 38 says, And he, which is Judah, said, I will send thee a kid from the flock, meaning a goat, a baby goat. I'll send you a kid from the flock. And she said, Will thou give me a pledge, or will you make a promise or a vow, till thou send it? And he, which is Judah, said, What pledge shall I give thee? And she said, The signet and thy bracelet. The signet would have been his ring that he do a stamp to make things official, right? The signet and the bracelet and thy staff that is in thine hand. And he gave it her and came in unto her, and she conceived by him. So the daughter-in-law now, the daughter-in-law tricked the daddy-in-law. Now, I, I, now I, I kind of confused her because I don't know if she probably was having intercourse and had her head bandaged up. That's kind of weird to me, but I can go with what the Bible say. She has now conceived or she got pregnant as a result of her sexual interaction with her father-in-law. This is going to be very serious going forward. Verse 19 of Genesis 38 says, And she, which is Tamar, arose and went away, and laid by her, and laid by her veil from her, and put on her garment of her widowhood. And Judah sent the kid goat by the hand of his friend, the Adolamite, to receive his pledge or his promise from the woman's hand, but he found her not. Verse 21, then he asked the men of that place, saying, Where is the harlot that was openly by the wayside? And they said, There was no harlot in this place. And he returned to Judah and said, I cannot find her. 
And also the men of the place said that there was no harlot in the place. So verse 23 of Genesis 38 says, And Judah said, Let her take it to her. Sorry. And Judah said, Let her take it to her, lest we be shamed. Behold, I sent this kid, and thou hast not found her. Or now you shame. Okay. So verse 24 says, And it came to pass about three months afterwards that it was told Judah, saying, Tamar, uh -huh, thy daughter-in-law, had placed the had played the harlot, and also, behold, she is with child, or she pregnant, by whoredom. And Judah said, bring her forth and let her be burnt. Hmm, really? So verse 25 of Genesis 38 says, when she was brought forth, she went to her father-in-law, saying, by the man who these are, am I with child? So what did that mean? She gave him a signet ring. She gave him his bracelet. She gave him her, his staff. Yeah, the fellow who I pregnant for, uh, daddy-in-law, uh, that fellow will be you. This is powerful. I want you to listen to this. Verse 25, when she was brought forth, she sent to her father-in-law saying, by the man whose these are, am I with child? And she said, discern, I pray thee, Whose are these? The signet and the bracelet and the staff. And Judah acknowledged them and said, She had been more righteous than I, because that I gave her not to Sheila my son. And he knew her again no more. And it came to pass in the time of her travail, or giving birth, that behold, twins were in her womb. And it came to pass when she travailed, that the one put out his hand, and the midwife took and bound upon his hand a scarlet thread, saying, This came out first. And it came to pass, as he drew back his hand, that, behold, his brother came out. And she said, How hast thou broken forth? This breach be upon thee. Therefore his name was called Pharez. And afterwards came out his brother, that had the scarlet thread upon his hand, and his name was Zara. Okay, now, I just laid the foundation for you. Judah being the fourth son of Leah and Jacob. You know, Judah was a part of the 12 tribes of Israel. This was the uh, genesis of the Hebrew people. However, we would have read where Judah had three sons originally, and two of those sons died which would have been Er and Onan. And the only son that he had by his wife left would have been Shelah. However, he then had two more sons, which were twins, that he had by his daughter-in-law, Tamar. And these twins, as I would have just read, their name was Pharez and Zara. Okay? Now, it is, this is where it becomes interesting. Because most people wouldn't see here that seeds were planted. No matter how it happened, because people will say, well, he didn't know, and my Lord, give the man a break. No, we ain't giving nobody no break, because ignorance is no excuse to the law. And the seeds that were planted by having children, which is sexual perversion, which your daughter-in-law, because the reality was, based on Jewish tradition, even though the two sons were deceased, she should have automatically, the, a union should have been forged between Sheila, the last son, and Tamar. But of course, Judah didn't want to do that because he was afraid I've already lost two sons, which is understandable. However, it does not negate the Jewish customs. So what he did is he kept his son back, even though he was grown. He never explained to her that he was grown, now you could come and you all could hook up and make some babies. No. So she said, okay, I got something for you. I can deal with you. She decided to take off her widow attire and dress like a harlot, covering her face. So when he came to Tamna, whatever that place was, he then now began to uh, make a preposition to her. She inclined. Of course, we could hook up, but what you can give me? So he said, well, I could give you a, a, a kid, a whole goat. Okay, we can give you a whole goat. She said, well, that's beautiful, but that goat ain't here right now. So what is going to be your pledge to me? What are you going to give me that I can hold on to temporarily until that goat roll up in here? So he said, no problem. What I will give you is my signet ring. I will give you my bracelet, and I will give you my staff. So now when I would have brought the goat, then you could give me these things back. She said, okay, cool. Let's get it on. They got it on. And the Bible says she went away, took off her hollow attire, 
and put on now her widow's attire. Uh, Judah now sent his friend back to bring this goat. He didn't want to come no more because he's shamed now. He didn't hook up with his harlot. He sent his friend back, and the people at the city they said, We don't know about no harlot. We don't have no harlot, right? What do you think this is? Okay, we ain't got no harlots here. So he went back and he explained to Judah, Judah, these people don't know what I'm talking about, blah, blah, blah. Three months later, according to scripture, it says that Judah learned that Tamar, his daughter in law, who should have been married to the last son at this point, is now playing the harlot. He said, Bring that harlot here. We will burn her. So when they went and get her, they brought her there. She said, Yes, I, I, I was playing the harlot, like you say. And fuck, I'm pregnant. But I'm going to give you the proof of who I'm pregnant for. Do you recall the signet ring? Hmm? Look familiar to you? Do you recall this, this, this bracelet? Huh? I tell you what, what about this staff? Does this, does this look familiar to you? Judah then uh, retreat, and he said to himself, My Lord, boy to Ma, you are more righteous than me. Because I deceive you in regards to my son Shelah. He was well grown, and I never brought him back to you as I promised. And the Bible says after he learned that she was pregnant with twins, he never dealt with her anymore after that. He went his way. However, running away from what has already physically been implemented and that has already starred the spiritual implications for the future, you can't erase that now. See, if you didn't deal with that, like I said, when you don't deal with these seeds, then these seeds will deal with you. All right? Now, where do we go from here now? Well, just to give you some, 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 some background here in terms of Onan and those, I want to give you scriptures on what I've said also, right? And in terms of, uh, in terms of Judah's children, because he had a total of five children. He had Ur, Onan, Sheila, Ferez, Zerah, whatever the next one name, right? Three with his wife, two with his sons, so with his daughter-in-law, sorry, all right? So you will find the generation of these people in Genesis chapter 46, verse 12. Okay, I want to give you scripture for everything that I'm saying, Genesis 46, verse 12, and also Numbers 26, verses 20 to 22. And that'll give you the whole story about uh, Judah's children, all right? Genesis 46, verse 12, Numbers 26, 20 to 22. Now we are about to enter the future, okay? And we're going to now take it up from the sons or the twins that Tamar and Judah, her father-in-law, had together, all right? And this is where it's going to become powerful. So let's go to the book of Ruth. Let's go to the book of Ruth. See, you got to go way back in the past. That's what we're doing now. We're going in the past to see why these events are happening in the future. They not be, See, when you understand spiritual laws and rules, you will know right away. Your cousin who was a lesbian, your uncle who's a homosexual, that didn't happen the day they started practicing that or the day you noticed that. And this is what I need people to understand. When you're knocking and condemning these people, you, you need to go back. What is happening to them are just the tentacles of a root. It's the harvesting of seeds that was planted some time back. And this is how generational curses erupt. Whomever would have made the infraction or the breach against God laws presumptuously and continuously in that bloodline, then that was the spiritual opening for that spirit of sexual perversion, that spirit of incest, that spirit of sweetheart keeping or adultery, that spirit of sleeping with different people. That didn't happen when that person went away. And what I'm telling you this is because the whole purposes of these teachings is to teach you to be proactive. Kevin making sense. So before this happened to my son, my grandchildren, my future generation, Kevin, give me what I need to do to break it, to break the spiritual implication so that I will never be a part of this bloodline anymore. That's what you need. Not so and see it. No. You need to understand why am I failing in my marriage? <coughs> why am I on my third marriage? I don't want this. When I married, I wanted to be married to one woman. You wanted to be married to one man. But now that you look back, Guess what? Your mother married multiple times. Her mother married multiple times. Your Grammy married multiple times. It was told to you that your great-great-grandmother had several husbands. How, how, how is this possible? How? This is what you're not getting. This is not what you're not being taught. See, this is what I keep telling you. You're getting mad at me. 
I don't care about your preacher preach blessing. Preaching blessing could never break a generational curse. You have to do it the prescribed way as it relates to scripture to sever the spiritual cords, the spiritual shackles, and the spiritual anchors. These things you cannot see. And as a result of the ignorance, it empowers the curse so each generation get worse. Boy, I'm trying to help somebody today. I'm trying to help you today. Don't get mad at me today. You're just getting too juicy. So let's go now. <laughs> let's go to Ruth. Let's go to the book of Ruth, and we're going to look at Ruth chapter 4, and we're going to read from verse 18 to verse 22. The Bible says, and this is my favorite scripture, Proverbs chapter 11, verse 9b, through knowledge shall the just be delivered. How? I know many of you Christians out there, Lord, I cannot rub two pennies together. I cannot save no money. Why is it I'm a Christian? I pay tithe like they ask me to do. I give seed. I do this fruit. I do all that. What you don't understand is that seed, fruit, time, there is no scripture that you will find by giving some monetary whatever, spinning around, flipping around, it's going to break a, of an invisible force. An invisible force is governed by spiritual rules. And if you are ignorant to the rules, you are now a coca spider to your own demand. I'm talking to somebody today. I to get somebody on, listen, you need to call someone to listen right now to Dove, get them on Facebook, get them on YouTube because they're in bondage and they need to hear this information. They need to hear this revelation. So according to Ruth chapter 4, beginning at verse 18, it says, now these are the generations of Perez. Who was Perez? Perez was the first son of Judah and Tamar. Now, so verse 4, sorry, verse 18, hold on, verse 18 says, now these are the generation of Perez. Perez begat Hezron, that was his son, right? Hezron begat Ram, and Ram begat Aminadab, and Aminadab begat Nashon, and Nashon begat Salmon, and Salmon begat Boaz, and Boaz begat Obed, and Obed, excuse me, beget Jesse. Mm -hmm. And Jesse beget who? David. Mm. Now, who David is this? This was David who would become King David. Now, why is this important, Mr. Ewing? Because I'm trying to show you how this invisible force is just taking its time and just striving through the bloodline and everybody is ignorant of it. Everybody is totally ignorant of the spiritual tentacles, how these evil spirits are contorting the minds of these people through the spirit of sexual perversion. Boy, I talking to somebody today. Listen to me carefully. So as you would have seen here now, that David is a descendant of Judah. That's the same bloodline Jesus came through. He is the descendant of, of Perez. This is his great, 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 great grandfather. David, that is. Now, why, why, why are we landing on David here today? Well, let's see some attributes that David had that from that point, it, it just seemed like he was being a regular man. But no, until we would have gone back all the way to Judah and come to Tamar and him and all of this crazy stuff going on, now it's going to make sense. David had several wives. Mm -hmm. In fact, he had a total, if I can recall here, okay, David had several wives, right? David, let me, let me tell you his resume. David committed adultery with Bathsheba, listen, Bathsheba, sorry, which resulted in David conspiring with the chief of his army, which is Joab, to have Bathsheba's husband, an innocent man, Uriah the Hittite, murdered. Now check this out. But Bathsheba was his last wife. He had a total of, let me see, one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. He had a total of seven or eight wives. Anyway, Bathsheba was the last one, right? He had his first wife, her name was H-I-N-O-A-M, then Abigail, then Macha, Hai Githit, Abatol, Egla, and then Bathsheba. Seven whole women this fella had. Seven. 
Bathsheba being the last one, right? Aside from that, like I said, through adultery and murder, he's sleeping with this man's wife. This man is committed to Israel as a soldier to Israel, fighting for his country, do, did nothing wrong, okay? David, who should have been up to, in, in the war with them, he up on his roof watching Bathsheba taking the bath naked. I don't know who's bathed naked on their roof. But I ain't go to the day. We can talk about that another day. But anyway, in any event, in any event, the spirit of sexual perversion that was already in the bloodline is finding this fine opportunity to now impose its will on this man's spirit. He don't even realize it. He have no knowledge that his attraction towards this woman is to only continue the course of the sexual perversion, the curse of sexual perversion already in the bloodline. That now spin off a chain of events where he was having full-fledged sexual relationship with this woman. Uh, he then called Uriah from the army and said, man, listen, take a break, go relax. When, he, when David woke up the morning, meet Uriah right to his doorpost. And he said, why didn't you go? Because at this point, Bathsheba is pregnant. So David is trying to pin this baby on him by saying, listen, go sleep with your wife. But homeboy so dedicated to his family, to his country, says, no, my, there's no way in the world I could be enjoying the pleasures of the flesh, knowing that my fellow man is on the battlefield losing their lives for Israel. David wasn't hearing that. No, 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 no. Hey, this ain't no time for no, no, no loyalty around here. So David decides to write a letter to Joab, which was the captain of the army of Israel, and says in this letter, he says, allow uh, Uriah to go and command all of the other soldiers to drop back, which means that this is eminent. There's no way he could escape it. So Uriah, so proud that not only is he going back to the battlefield, but he has a signed, sealed document from the king of Israel. He is so proud to be chosen as the one to take this to Joab, the captain of the army. So he's running and smiling and so elated, not knowing that this was a death warrant against him. He gives it to Joab. Look at him. Joab, read it. Joab, look at him. Mm, what do they say? Looking good for you. He said, go in front there. And when he went in the front, he tell the rest of the soldiers, drop back. An innocent Uriah who did nothing was killed. What is prompting all of this? Well, let's go back in the bloodline. Let's look at the deceit that uh, Judah did towards Tamar when he promised her that she would have the last son when he was older. He got older, but he never had any com communications with the woman, never told her anything. He lied to her. She in turn deceived him, okay? She dressed up like a harlot, slept with her father-in-law, got pregnant with twins for her father-in-law. So all kind of spiritual doors are open now to invite the spirit of perversion into the family. So generations later, generations later, more than 10 generations later, David pop up on the scene. And now he's being, yes, he's a man of God after his own heart. All of those scriptures are true. But what I'm trying to show you people is that you cannot discount the obvious. You cannot discount the negative patterns that you are seeing in your bloodline. Where did it come from? Where did this start? How do we break it? So the Bible says that David had this man killed. Not only did he have the man killed. David now is about to suffer some major, major issues among his own children. David had a, a total of 19 sons and one daughter. The daughter name was Tamar. And guess what happened to her? Her brother, uh, I think his name was Amnon, A-M-N-O-N. All right? Uh, you'll find this, you can write this down in 2 Samuel 13. 2 Samuel 13. Guess what? The boy, Amnon, fell in love with his sister. I think they had different mothers. But David was their daddy. And he raped her. He slept with his sister and raped her. Okay, of course, this set off, uh, uh, I think his name was Absalom. So he raped his sister. Look at the incest again. Look at the incest again. Where is this coming from? Well, if you go back to Judah again, and we look at the, where the, the, the platform was laid out for all of the spiritual tentacles that is traveling through the future generation, and it's going to now levy itself on every and any available family member. They don't know why they're sleeping with their sister. They don't know why they have these strong sexual desires for their sister and brother. They don't know why they feel so hot for their auntie. Why you feel this way? What's wrong with you? Put it in them. 
It's the spirit. The Bible said we are not wrestling against flesh and blood. It's a spirit that is on them that have a right to be in the family. And the power of the spirit is the ignorance of the family members, not knowing that it's a generational curse, rearing its head at any given opportunity to now levy its evil and suppress the will of these people to impose its own will in their lives. Boy, I'm talking to somebody today. So David now start having some problems, right? Guess what? So Amnon, his son, raped his sister Tamar, both of David's children. It didn't end there. Absalom, Absalom, okay, Absalom, which is one of David's sons, decided to sleep with all of David's wives. And guess where he did it? Guess where he did it? On the rooftop. On the rooftop so the entire nation of Israel will see it. Brought his daddy to shame. Look at the filth. Look at it. Look at look at this. Look at this. Now sitting back and just reading these stories, when you don't know the, the, the laws and the principles of generational curses, you just see it as a regular story until you connect the dots together. Same thing happened in your family, whether it's sexual, whether whatever it is, there always is a cause to the effect that you're seeing. So the Bible says here, according to scripture, that Absalom slept with his father's wives in full view of the nation of Israel. He did it on the rooftop on purpose. Now you'll find this in 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 16, verses 21 to 23. Okay? Now, aside from Solomon, Eba had other children with David. But Solomon would be the one who would take over the kingship when David died. Now, you all know I agree with this, right? How many wives Solomon had again? I didn't get that. You said 700? No, no, no. You mean seven. No, 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 no. 700 wives and 300 concubines. In the Bahamas, we say sweethearts. In America, they say side pieces. All the same. Fish fry, fry fish. Where is this dude getting this appetite to, to, to be engaged sexually with all these people? It ain't him. You all silly listen to me, you know. It is the spirit. It is the curse on his life. You see, a generational curse, something went down, would invite its specific spirits to this bloodline. And it is the right of those spirits to enforce their will on the family members. Whether, you, whether it's a family of failure, whether it's a family of anti-marriage, whether it's a family of anti-progress, whether it's a family of sexual perversion, there are specific spirits assigned to override the will of those people. The thing about it, and this is how you know you under a curse, you could see the curse in everybody else except yourself. In fact, you could point out the same thing would happen to you and the family across the road but cannot see it in yourself. Who am I talking to today? Who am I talking to today? Who am I talking to today? Somebody need to hear this today today. Somebody need to hear this because the reason why you're not moving the way you're supposed to be progressing in Christianity is because there are some spiritual impediments. And I know they told you. They gave you Galatians 3. They said to you, curse as anything is hanging upon the tree. You are under grace and you are not cursed. Well, either they crazy or you crazy. Because I can't see... Before you got saved, you had cancer. Before you got saved, you was broke. Before you got saved, you had liver problem. You got saved, nothing changed. You didn't go to Scotia Bank and see $8.6 million on your account with that zero before you got saved. Your leg, what was cut off from diabetes, didn't go back after you got saved. Your diagnosis wasn't changed. So what is the problem? If they're telling me I'm not under a curse no more, if they're telling me that Christ took, Christ, all of what they're saying in terms of what the Bible say is true. Hey, nothing, that is true. But there are rules, regulations, laws, protocols that Christians hate to follow because they figure once I save now, I may wait on my big check from Jesus. I know Jesus is going to send a, somebody to bring me a whole whopping $2 million here and I can pay these people a suit and tea for all my life and all this garbage. Foolishness. I want one Christian to call Dove right now and tell me when they became saved, all their troubles just run away from them because they're not under the curse anymore. Garbage, nonsense, foolishness, erroneous teaching. What Jesus did at the cross, he has given us the right through his name to fight these things, to break them. Try that. So we, we, we need to understand exactly what we're dealing with. And let's study and read for ourselves. 
So the Bible says here now, watch this now, Solomon who had 700 wives. Look at all of these evil things happened to this bloodline. Years later, generations later, generations later. Now, I saved the juicy part for last. I got to wipe my face here. I saved the juicy part for last. All right? You all ready for this, right? You all ready for this? It didn't start with Judah. Oh, man, I just feel some chill bumps right now. It didn't start with Judah. No, oh, no, no, Kevin, what you mean? You forget it was Judah who slept with Tamar and this incest and Perez and all these other people. Kevin, now look at, look at David. You, Kevin, you make sense. I know I make sense. But listen to me carefully, though. The curse did not start with Judah. Listen, I can tell you now, put on your scuba gear. We are about to go deep right now. I trying to show the people who have ears to hear, and I want you to hear me today. Whatever you're dealing with right now, whether you have a curse of poverty on your life, whether you have a curse of backwardness, whether you have a curse of rejection, please hear me and hear me today. It did not start with you. You are just a character in this whole play. You are just the tentacle. You are just a branch that is spouting from the root. Our journey today is to find the root. And we did not find the root in Judah. Judah himself was a tentacle of the sexual perversion from his bloodline. Kevin, talk to me. I was hoping you would say that. Okay, now let's go now. We're going deep now. I got to sit up right. Because we're going deep. Because when I was studying this boy, listen, I was like, Lord, look at this. Look, look, look at, look at this. Look at what we, what we missing. And well, you know, we, people got to teach us this every day. You know, if we went into the process of breaking these things, how much of us will just be catapulted to our destinies? How much of us will never have to face divorce? Boy, look here. When I was on my fast, you know, I, Father, my children will never ever experience a divorce. I break that curse from the root. I sever, dig up every anchor that has already been levied on their life. Let it be consumed in the realm of the spirit. I break every curse of poverty, backwardness, rejection, selfishness, pride. Father, let it be destroyed. Release them from these spiritual cages. See, if you don't do that, then what you are doing is you're sitting back and waiting for your children to re replay the things you saw in your brothers, your sisters, your auntie, your uncle. All of them dead from cancer. But you don't know number no generational crisis. So you sit right back and tell your beautiful daughter, you don't spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on her education to be doctor, lawyer, Indian chief. All of this stuff, right? For her to be diagnosed now. Mommy, you know I got breast cancer. Oh, Lord Jesus. Oh, Lord, let me call Pastor Kevin. Oh, Pastor Lord. Oh, Lord, call the prayer warriors. Call the prayer warriors. I don't think you understand what's happening here. Prayer warriors to do what? Prayer warriors to do what? What is happening here has a legal right to happen spiritually. Nobody is dealing with the root. If you don't deal with the root, the root is clearly dealing with y'all. you got to deal with the root. Your, these fiery prayers, what is that going to do? So now I'm going to take you to the root. Now, it took you from Judah all the way in the future to Solomon. And I showed you the travesties of sexual perversion and immorality in that bloodline. And originally, you'd have thought that it all began with Judah because we started with him. Yes, I picked him to show you through his bloodline, but it did not start with him. Okay? Now, let me show you where all of this starts, and this is where it's going to become juicy. Let's go here now to Genesis. Genesis chapter 11, all right? And now let's go here to, let's go to verse 23. Genesis chapter 11, verse 23. This is going to be so powerful and so interesting right now. And I'm telling you, and I know what's happening to you right now. See, what this is going to do for you, and this is why I give so much scripture. This is going to give you a hunger to read the Word of God. This is going to give you an insatiable desire. Man, I got to read this myself. Man, these, these things in the Bible are true. Man, this boy, this boy serious. And this, this is going to make you love the Bible. 
and I thank God that he's given me the, 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 the gift to break the scriptures down, to make them pardonable, to make you understand, hey, look here, this is exactly what's happening. So in Genesis chapter 11, beginning at verse 23, and it says, And Serug lived after he begat Naor 200 years and begat sons and daughters. And Naor lived nine and twenty years, and he had his first child, Terah, or Terah. Now, who is Terah? Well, as we are about to read, Tiro, otherwise known as Terah, was the father of Abram, who later became Abraham. Okay? Tiro had three sons. The first one was Abram. The second one was named after his father, Naor. And then Tiro had a third son by the name of Haran. Unfortunately, Haran died in the land of his nativity, which was Ur, Ur of the Chaldees, right, where they were all from. So the truth was, they didn't serve the God of Abraham, sorry, the, the God whom Abraham later discovered to be the, 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 the God of the universe. They served other gods, right? So let's get this straight now. Naor had a son named Terah. Terah had three sons, Abram, Naor, and Haran. Haran died, okay? Then the Bible says that the remaining sons, which was Abram and Naor, took to themselves wives, or they got married. And Abram met this lady by the name of Sarai, whom we know to be Sarah later. And he married her. Now watch this. Naor, his only living brother, also got a wife. And guess what her name was? Her name was Milcha, M-I-L-C-H-E, I think it is. But guess what? Milcha was his niece, which was also the niece of Abram. And she was the daughter of their deceased brother, Haran. Hold on now, because all of this is going to lead straight to the bloodline of Judah. Because we're going to see now, hundreds of years before Judah even came into existence, seeds were being planted that would dictate the course of this bloodline, of this particular family, in an incestual, sexual, perverted way. Quite talking to somebody. And I don't have the time to go deep right now. But this whole idea of incest wasn't by accident. This was a part of the gods that they serve in Ur of the Chaldees. This was worship to their gods where you had to marry your cousin, your sister, your auntie. This is why when God told the children of Israel by Moses, when they was going to the promised land, he says, do not let your sons marry their daughters or your daughters marry their sons. At least they will pull you away from your God. Then he went into uh, Leviticus 18, 22 and 20 where it talks about sexual sins. Don't sleep with your sister. Don't sleep with your mommy. Well, who can do them things? The same herb, the Chaldeans, which were the descendants which, 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 which the descendants of the Canaanites came from. Again, when you do your history, when you do your research, all, if all the dots are going to connect right now. So check this out now. You've got to hear this. So Abraham, sorry, Naor married his niece, which was Milcher, which was Haran who died, daughter. Haran had another son by the name of Lot. So Haran had two children, Milcher and Lot. And Milcher married Naor, which was her uncle. But the incest didn't end there. It didn't end there. Guess what? Abram's wife, Sarai, was his sister. Kevin, stop talking, fool. No, you stop talking, fool. You stop talking, fool. I got all my stuff right here. Listen, listen to this, okay? In Genesis, if you go to Genesis chapter 20, and you read from verse 9 to verse 12, it made it very clear that Sarah was the, was the sister of Abraham. They had the same father, but different mothers. Boy, I talking to somebody today. Lord, I talking to somebody today. I telling y'all, listen to me, yeah? Y'all all about calling y'all your children and, and sissy, uncle, and so on. Stop saying those things. Listen, because all you're doing is compounding the legal right that that spirit has there, rather than calling these people sissy, homosexual, lesbian, go and do your research. Because guess what? If you have children or you're about to have children, 
that same spirit could levy itself upon that child because no one break the ancestral and generational curses of sexual perversion. Talking nonsense. So Genesis chapter 20 verses 12 actually, but read from verse 9 to verse 12, where it is made very clear that Sarah was the sister of Abraham. He married his sister because they had the same father. But the father didn't object because this was their culture in Ur of the Chaldees in Haran. See, you, you listen, do your research. Now watch this now. This is going to get you to see. So Abraham married Sarah, which was his sister, right? Now all of this you're going to find in Genesis chapter 11, verse 27 to verse 30, all right? As it relates to Tiro and uh, Abram and all of that, right? So Genesis 11 verse 27 to verse 30. So Abraham married Sarah and Naor married Milka. M-I-L-C-A-H. Milka, right? Which was his niece. So Naor married his niece and Abraham, yeah, I can show you something. I can go do you right now. I can marry my sister. So he married his sister, right? Now watch this now. Abraham and Sarah had a son and guess what his name was? Isaac. You remember that guy, right? You remember him, right? Now, Naor and Milka had several children, but the last child that they had, his name was Bethul, which would have made Isaac and Bethul for his cousins, okay? Because they're two brothers' children. Bethul had a daughter. You all know this daughter, right? Her name was Rebecca. Guess who married Rebecca? Guess, Isaac. So what was the relationship between Isaac and Rebecca, second cousins? See, these people keeping it all in the family. I am trying, I'm, all I'm doing, because I did my research, I am walking you through the incest of this family that what was levied upon Judah, it had a right to because nobody break the curse. So now, Isaac has married his second cousin, which name, what was her name again? Her name was Rebecca, right? And you will find this here in, uh, in Genesis 24, verse 15. Okay, that's Genesis 24, verse 15, all right? Now, Isaac and Rebecca had two children. Y'all remember the story, right? And the name of these children were Jacob and Esau. Y'all know the story, right? And you know, Jacob was a swindler, he was a deceiver, he was whatever, all that other stuff, right? However, Rebecca had a brother by the name of Laban. Remember who this Rebecca is now? Rebecca is the one who married Isaac, right? And remember Isaac and Rebecca had two children, Esau and Jacob, right? Rebecca had a brother by the name of Laban, right? So whatever was produced from the union of Isaac and Rebekah, they would have been the nephews and nieces of Laban because that would have been their uncle. Laban had two daughters. And guess what their names were? Leah and Rachel. Guess who married Leah and Rachel, which would have been their first cousins? Guess, Jacob. So Jacob married his first cousins because Jacob, uh, mother, Rebecca, and Laban, her brother, which would have been their uncle, they're, they're two sisters and brothers' children. So Jacob now marries Leah, watch this now, Leah and, 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 and Rachel, okay? Which would have made them first cousins. I hope you all see the incest here, you know. I hope you're all listening to what's happening here. Because I'm saying to you, I started off with Judah. And I took you all the way down to the 10th generation, there, to all 10 or 11th generation, all the way there to King Solomon. And I showed you all of the incestual travesties and the sexual perversion in that bloodline. And when I would have ended with Solomon, I brought you right back to Judah again. I says, but whoa, 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 back up. I got a surprise for you. It didn't start with Judah. Now I'm taking you all the way back to Genesis now, where you had the man by the name of Naor. Naor was the father of Terah, or Terah, right? Terah was the father of uh, Abram 
Naor in Haran, okay? Haran died in the nativity of his land, meaning that he died before his father. But the two remaining brothers decide to take on themselves wives, but not by no other family members. No, they kept it all in-house. But this was all normal. And Abram married his sister. They had a different mother, but the same daddy, which would have been Tiro. Naor, the, last, the other remaining brother, a son of, of Tira, he married his niece, which was his deceased brother's daughter, Milka. His deceased brother also had another son by the name of Lot. So Naor, okay, and Milka had a bunch of children, I think about eight or nine of them, right? They had children, but guess what? when you read to the 30th voice of Genesis 11, you will also read that, 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 that uh, what's his name? Naor, Naor, who was married to his niece, also had a sweetheart and made some children with them. I've given you the scriptures. You don't have to believe me. Go and read it yourself. You will see it yourself. All right? So now, Naor and Betul, sorry, Naor and, and, and what's her name, Milka, their last child, Betul, which was a boy, which would have been Isaac's for his cousin. He had a daughter. Okay? Her name is what? Rebecca. Rebecca and Isaac married. This was his second cousin. He married a second cousin. They, sorry, Isaac and Rebecca, uh, they had two children, which would have been Jacob and, like I would have said to you, Esau. Uh, Rebecca had a brother by the name of Laban, which, was, which would have been Jacob's uncle. He had two daughters, Leah and Rachel. He married his two first cousins. He had the the children, the, in fact, the Hebrew people was produced from this union because Jacob and his 12 sons, and he had one son named, 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 named Dinah. All right? Now watch this now. Here's what I want you to look at now. That I can take you on a, on a whole new different spin. I will show you, and I've been preaching this for years. For years I've been preaching this. For years. And I always said to you, I said, wherever you see generational curses, Mark my words, at some point in that bloodline, sorcery was practiced. Because this is the only way, according to scripture, uh, Exodus chapter 20 verses 1 to 20, where God told them, I am a jealous God, serve God, don't practice no foolishness. He says, but if you do, listen where a generational curse can come in now. He says, I will visit the iniquity or the foolish obey and witchcraft you was doing, I will visit it upon your current children and I will secure this curse or allow this curse to run its course at minimum to the third and fourth generation. You'll find this in Exodus 34, you will find this in Deuteronomy and well, the people from uh, St. Paul of Methodist Church, I give them a whole cadre of scriptures where God says, I will take the, the iniquities of your children and put them in the bosom of your children. I'll take the iniquities of the father, sorry, and put them into the bosom of the children. I gave a cadre of scriptures from every part of the Bible showing this principle. So now, Naor, sorry, yes, Naor, Naor, which would have been the grandfather of Abraham, right? Naor, who also would have been the father of Tira, which was Abraham's daddy. They serve other gods. They practice sorcery. Kevin, prove this. No problem. I love proving these things. So let's go to Joshua very quickly. Let's go to Joshua 24. And let's look at verse 2. Listen to what Joshua 24 verse 2. And remember who Tira and who Tira father was. Tira was the father of Abraham. And his father, Tira father, name was Naor. In Joshua 24 verse 2 it says, And Joshua said unto all the people, Thus said the Lord God of Israel, your fathers dwelt on the other side of the flood in old time. Even who? Tira. Who is Tira again? Tira is the father of Abram. Tira is the father of Naor. Tira is the father of Haran. Even Tira, listen, the father of Abraham and the father of Nahor. Listen, listen. And they serve other gods. That's what I'm reading here. See, we want to make sense of the scriptures. We don't want to make up stuff. We don't want to add and take away. We want to make sense. Now, this scripture is showing a breach in the law. 
a serious breach. Let's make sense out of this. Let's read it again. And Joshua said unto all the people, Thus said the Lord God of Israel, Your fathers dwelt on the other side of the flood in all time, even Tiro, the father of Abraham, and the father of Naor. And they, who's this they? Tira, Naor, Abram, all of them. They serve other gods. This is before God visited Abraham in Genesis 12 and said to him, Come from among my kindred. Come from among these Obia workers. Come from among these witchcraft workers. Come from these people all about in the graveyard, dancing naked, doing fooling and pleasing devils. Come from among them. Now, here is where it's going to make sense now. In Genesis, sorry, in Joshua 24 verse 2, it is clearly revealed that Abram, including his brothers, those, and his daddy, and his granddaddy, them serve other gods. So here's the infraction now. So let's go to Exodus 20, Exodus 20, because we're going to see what was the root. How did this generational curse of perversion came in? Let's go to Exodus 20, and we're going to read from, from verse 1 to verse 5. So Exodus 20, beginning at verse 1, says, And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. That's what I'm reading. Clear instructions. So the, 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 the key here is, you should don't be worshipping no Baal, don't be worshipping no Astrod, Confucius, none of that. If this is a God of Abraham, you are serving another God. If you are going to people to work magic, you are serving another God. If you are making pledges to Greek gods and different societies, you are serving another God according, not to Kevin's opinion, scripture. And when you do these things, this creates the door, this opens the door spiritually for curses to enter that did not have the right before and the curses are going to be curses of poverty curses of sexual perversion curses of confusion curses of rejection curses of backwardness curses of anti-marriage curses of anti-promotion well kevin how you know they're curses now how do we prove it let's look at the consistency in the family tree grandpa was like this daddy was like this i am like this my sons are like this my grandchildren are the same way all of the women in our family, all of them have children for different men. They didn't want that. That wasn't a plan. But we see it happen with our aunts. We see it happen with, with this one over here, this cousin, this niece, our third cousin. The same thing happening to them. How is all of this happening? Why is this trend? But now we begin to go back in the bloodline. And we heard a rumor that daddy... And mummy was a part of a big secret society. And we learn later some things that they do in there that has nothing to do with the Lord Jesus Christ. But then when we got a hold of the scriptures and we look at what God is saying here, do not serve no other God according to Exodus 20 verse 3. Listen to verse 4 and verse 5. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in the heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the sea, under the earth. Thou shalt bow down thyself to them. These altars you all got in your home. These altars you all got out there in the sea with the water spirits. These altars you all got in the bush in the forest. The minute you put your hand to those things and begin to serve those gods for luck, for opportunity, to hurt other people, to take fix off you, at that very moment the covenant is being made with devils. And this is now what is giving those spirits the right because they, this person say, God, you can't stop us. You said it. That if they serve or bow to any other God, you said now you will allow the visitation of the iniquities of what they've done on their current children. And you will secure this curse at minimum to the third and fourth generation, which we're about to read right now. So he says in verse 3, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in the heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Verse 5. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. And what are you going to do because of your jealousy, Mr. God? Well, here's what I'm going to do. I will visit the iniquity of the fathers the forefathers, the ancestors, I will visit their evil upon the current children and I'm going to secure this evil 
to the third and to the fourth generation of those that hate me. My God, I hope you're getting this. I hope you're getting this. I hope you're getting this. It is not by accident, this evil negative trend in your family. Somebody, it may not be the current generation. It may not have been the past. It may have been way before them. But what they did, they, they opened up a door spiritually that nobody could see. And when they, what they didn't know, this was ushering these forces now. And, and the agreements that they would have made at these evil altars, the agreements they would have made in the graveyard or wherever they did, their foolishness. The spirits that were assigned to that family, they are the enforcers of the curse. They must ensure that nobody in this family progress in a particular way. Whereas they will never get promoted. They will always get so far in life, but have to start all over again. A lot of you have the spirit of starting over all over again. You get here, you, you meet some dude, he take you around the world, jet set you. Only to pick up and leave you for no reason. But yet, you're now in your 40s. You've been having this problem but since you had boyfriend in school. All the way till you're 40 now. Guys love you, they find you to be pretty attractive, smart, intelligent. You good wifey material. But they don't treat you like no wife. Where is this consistency coming from? Well, let's go back some more. Let's go back when mommy them used to work rich and sweetheart other people's husband. When mommy keeps seeing married men all her life. She's now in her 60s and 70s. But you will see something? Look at mommy children. Every last one of their marriages failed. And the ones which are still together is only a matter of time because there's a time already set that that marriage will be dissolved. Why? Because mommy, God said, listen, when you do evil, you're not listening. I will visit your evil, your iniquity upon your innocent children who had nothing to do with this and I will secure it to the third and fourth generation. Who am I talking to today? Don't get mad at me. Get mad at the scriptures. Claire. Now, Kev, why are you bringing this up? Well, I brought that up as proof to substantiate and to, to, to validate what we would have read in Joshua 24, verse 2, where the scriptures didn't have to say it, but it made mention of it, only for us to put the pieces together. And it says that, listen, Naor, Terah, Abram, uh, Naor, which is also uh, Abram's brother, he says all of them serve other gods. All of them. Of course... In Genesis 12, things changed for Abram. God called, him, God called him and he obeyed him. But that didn't stop anything because I want to show you where the spirit of witchcraft now is still walking through the family. Oh, I, oh this can be so juicy. So listen to this now. Let's go to Genesis chapter 31. See, listen, you, you, all, you know what you're talking to right now? You're talking to a spiritual lawyer. See, I make sure to study my stuff relentlessly. Because when I present you with the facts, don't cuss me, cuss the scriptures, because I didn't write these scriptures. I want you to listen to this, okay? Let's go to Genesis chapter 31. Okay, Genesis 31. And this is now where Jacob, remember he married his two first cousins, right? All of them his first cousins. But now he was tired of laboring his uncle, mistreating him and depriving him of his wages. So he concocted a plan where he was going to leave Laban and go do his own thing because he's a gifted man. So he told his wife, listen, his wives, Leah and, 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 and the next one, you all pack up your stuff. We, we roll up over here, right? So uh, Rachel, sorry, who was more concerned about material things, was like, well, if we leave all of this inheritance that daddy would have given us, we ain't going to have none of this. But there is an item from her father that she took that is now going to bring all of what I've said so far about the serving other gods to light. Okay, so Genesis chapter 31, and we're going to read from verse 30 to verse 35. All right, Genesis chapter 31, and we're going to read from verse 30 to verse 35. And now through, sorry, and now though thou wouldest needs be gone, because, because thou saw longest after thy father's house, yet wherefore hast thou stolen my gods? Stolen my gods. Well, when I look up that term, stolen my gods, it was a family idol. So that means that Laban had a shrine or an idol that Leah, that uh, Rachel, himself and his wife, whoever, this is what they serve. This is powerful because what it's showing you here now, now is all going to make sense. All right?
So the scripture says here, he says, Yet wherefore thou hast stolen my gods. And Jacob answered and said to Laban, Because I was afraid, for I said, Preadventure, suppose thou wouldest take my force, but sorry, thou wouldest take by force thy daughters from me. With whomsoever thou findest thy gods, this is Jacob speaking, let him not live. Mm -mm, mm -mm. The family already curse. Witchcraft is already in the family. Jacob is about to bring a decree that is going to shorten the life of Rachel and he don't even know. Who was the one that stole the idol or the god, the image that the King James referred to it as? It was Rachel. And she hid it under her that when her daddy, Laban, became, look, looking through the tent, she said to her daddy, oh daddy, please don't come look underneath me because my health is on. But she had the thing hit underneath there. Guess who died in childbirth when they were having Benjamin? Yes. Yes. Rachel. But who made a declaration prior to all of this? Her husband, Jacob. And what did he say? He says, let whoever have that idol, have that shrine, have that image. Let that person die. Folks, until, listen, right now you should say, Lord, please give me the spirit of wisdom. Give me the spirit of understanding to understand your word, to put the pieces together. Father, it caused me to have a commitment to your word so I wouldn't live a form of godliness. I wouldn't live aesthetics and, and being superficial and cosmetics, but that you would take me deep into your word and give me the revelations to bring the dots together. Now that I know it, now Lord, help me to take this template based on what you've given me from your laws, your rules, your principles, your ordinance, and now let me fit this in my family. Let me fit this in the royal family. Let me fit this in the Ewing family. Let me fit this in the Bonaby family because I will see now where we went wrong. And based on this template, okay, I see where we went wrong. Daddy did this. Mommy did that. Uncle, I hear Addy used to do foolishness with spirits. Now it's making sense to us. It's making a whole heap of sense now. Now it's making sense. Okay? We need understanding. Now watch this now. So he says here, in verse 32, with whomsoever thou findest thy gods, let him not live before our brethren, discern thou what is thine with me, and take it to thee, for Jacob knew not, Jacob knew not that Rachel had stolen them. Verse 33 of Genesis 31. And Laban went into Jacob's tent, and into Leah's tent, and into the two maid servants' tent. But he found them not, meaning he didn't find the idol. Then went he out of Leah's tent and entered into Rachel's tent. Verse 34 of Genesis 31. Now Rachel had taken the image or the idol or the shrine and put them in the camel's furniture and sat upon them. And Laban searched all the tent but found them not. Verse 35 of Genesis 31. And she said to her father, Let it not displease my Lord, that I cannot rise up before thee. For the custom of women is upon me, meaning she is menstruating. And he searched, but found not the image. Here it is, this lady has an accursed thing in her presence. In fact, she's sitting on it. Not knowing that through the declaration of her husband, who's basically spoken, prophesied. The Bible says, if you decree a thing, it shall be established. The Bible says that death and life, these are all laws and rules, reside in the power of the tongue. So he says, let whoever have that idol, let them die. He had no idea that Rachel, whom he loved, whom he loved, was the one that would be found with it. And as you would have, when we read the story more, she had two children, Joseph, and then she had the son, Benjamin. She was a very bitter woman, and we're going to talk more about her now during all these series on generational curses. She was very, very bitter, especially when she couldn't have had, when she couldn't have children. And Leah, the one Jacob was never in love with, was popping up all these children. And she had some issues too, because each child that she had, she would say, oh, the Lord has have mercy on me, that my, father, my husband will now come and stay with me, blah, blah, blah. But Rachel was so upset one day, she says, you, you need to give me a baby. And he got upset. He said, I can't I give you. Only God can do that. I can put in the work, but it can be up to God to cause this thing to happen. 
She was very, very bitter, even in her dying, when she was giving birth to Benjamin. I can't remember the name that she gave him, but it was a negative name. And Jacob intervened right away. He said, no, 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 that will not be his name. And he changed his name to Benjamin, and she died. But what was so interesting about this idol that they had, not only did she die, her, her, her midwife died, and she died. I think they died separate times, but all because of this idol, this accursed thing that they had. And this was causing all of this craziness in there. So you see, at the end of the day, my friend, when you don't understand these things, then the idea is, is that you continually circle the same mountain over and over again. And like I would have shared with the congregants last week Sunday at St. Paul's Methodist Church, you are so heavily under the curse that you are now 30 years in bondage and you do not realize, hey, look, this light radio, I know I saw this at least about five or seven times I passed here before. But yet you're still going on the journey. You are 60 years in under oppression. And you say, wow, this same Paul radio, I remember passing this 60 years ago. And not only that, the curse is so grievous, just how you live your defeated, weightless life, you are watching it in your children. You are watching your grandchildren popping babies for different men like nobody business. Nobody will marry them. Nobody, you, the same thing will happen to you. But yet, there's nothing you could do. At least so you think. And you sit back there. You do not, you don't know, you, you, and guess what? This is the part I want you to hear. Traditionally, you go to church every Sunday. Every Sunday, in fact, you tell your children, child, listen, you better get to know Jesus, eh? Go find yourself in church and take your tithe and offering to pastor. Uh-huh. And what has that done for you for 60 years of oppression? Tell me, what has it done for you? You broke like the Ten Commandments, okay? You, you spend the first uh, 30 years of your life up the court steps trying to get child support from these fellas, okay? They couldn't wait for these children to get 18 to dump all of y'all. What, what could we look at from your consistent attendance Consistent paying tithes, but never, ever following the laws, the rules, the principles, and the ordinance of God. How did that work out for you? But yet, I can hear you now. Uh, a shift is coming. God is getting ready to turn that thing around again. I hear God say, so this and so that. When are you going to wake up? When are you going to come to the realization that it is utter dung? And if you are not applying the rules, the principles of God, you are a co-conspirator to your own demise. The devil have very little work to do with you because you are programmed. Hey, devil, now you stop it. You don't trick me today. I can trick myself. I can trick myself today, devil. You better stop it. Don't, don't you ever mess with my curses. Now watch your devil. I, now you sit over there. Now you go mess with Kevin and who trying to live right. And I can make sure I don't progress because that's what you're basically saying. And that is what has qualified you for a co-conspirator to your bondage. You're going to these hopeless places called churches following routines, following tradition. Look at your life. I, I don't know if someone got to go hide and video camera you and, and, and send you a, a, a file to see how you're living. You're living a defeated life. you 60, you 70. God, for 80 years you live in. And fear and worry and, and your punishment is you're watching your children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren get cut down like dogs. Cannot get ahead. You got five and six generations of family living under the same roof. Everybody cursed care and get a house. Everybody only could build as far as bell costs. Then either the bank come hurricane, break it down. Why 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 is this happening to you? Tell me why it happening to you but yet you'll cuss me 24 seven and I try to give you the knowledge and I ain't charging you a penny for it. I do it all the hard way, giving you, showing you, this is what you need to look at. This is what you need to deal with. But no, you won't hear that. You won't hear the false prophet tell you foolishness. All right, we'll keep following them then. Okay, and I always tell you, if you are not interested in being free from these things, then continue on the part that you are and you will be secure. You'll, be, you'll definitely be secure in a, a defeated life. And, and I don't care what no pastor or preacher say, generational curses are real. The evidence is in everyday life, everyday life. So watch this now. Like I said to you, God showed me clearly on my fast how to shut these things down. And again, I shared it with the church at St. Paul's Church on Sunday past. I've shared it in my seven-part teaching 
while I was on my 40 day fast, I did a seven part teaching called Encouragement During Your Time of Fasting. Very, very detailed teaching. And I was using the book of Isaiah 58, which is titled A Genuine Fast and How We Should Do It. And of course, from verse one to verse five, Israel was complaining to uh, Isaiah the prophet at that time, how they went on a fast and the things that God promised didn't come to pass. So God is now speaking to Isaiah in the text. He says, now, is this the fast that I have commissioned these people to do? Meaning that no, it's not the fast. They are still strifing with one another, cussing and rowing and still filled, filled with hate and bitterness. And that's why I said to you, pre your fast, you should deal with you first. Go before God, repent. People you need to apologize to, go to and fix those things. See, every, I, and I know it's going to happen January coming. They're going to go, everybody can go on this Daniel fast. And the more, they're more concerned about what they can eat or could eat as opposed to breaking these things in their lives. But that isn't what Isaiah 58 is telling us. He says, now, is this not the fast that I've chosen to you? This is verse 5 now. Then he goes into verse 6. He says, to break the bonds of wickedness, to undo heavy burdens, to set the captives free, and to break every yoke. Again, Israel was not bound by anything. There was no cord, there was no shackles, there was no chain on Israel. So what is he talking about? And when he say about set the captives free, nobody in Israel was locked up. There was no prisons where nobody... No, so therefore, he's referring to the spiritual, invisible restrictions levied on the lives of the children of Israel, and they didn't even know. So what does this mean? It means now that when we take this particular route in going on a fast, the initial, the initial tweaking will begin in the world of this, in the spiritual world or the invisible world. So the initial fixing of your life is going to begin spiritually, which only makes sense because spiritual warfare 101 dictates that everything happens initially in the spiritual realm before it's manifested in this physical world. So he says, in order to get verse six of Isaiah 58, then you must engage in verse seven. And what does verse seven says? He says, now this is how you start your fast. And he says here, in fact, let me turn there because I'm gonna read it right for you. Because uh, people believe they keep praying and screaming out to God on their fast. Oh Lord, turn it around, Jesus. Oh Lord, these bunch of no good politicians, these old oh, the port authority. This. No, 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 again, you done lost. What are you doing dealing with fleshly stuff? We wrestle not against flesh and blood. You, you, you done start off wrong long time. So Isaiah 58, and looking at verse 7 now, in order to get the results of verse 6 and verse 8. But verse 6 is all spiritual. Verse 7, sorry, verse 8 going forward is now going to show the physical manifestation of when we would have followed verse 7. It's going to correct things in the spiritual realm in verse 6. And the physical evidence of it, like I would have said, was now going to be produced in verse 8. So verse 6 says, is not this the fast that I've chosen to loose the bands of wickedness, to undo heavy burdens, and to let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke. None of this was physically seen in Israel. This is all spiritual. So he says now, verse 7 says, this is how you start the fast. Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry? So you who aren't eating anymore during the fast or not drinking or whatever, you've deprived yourself from food. He says, now you must go and find people whom the Lord will lead you to, to assist, to help. This is the protocol. He didn't say pray all day. He didn't say chandala mandala and go off in tongues and out in the public so people could see you looking all skinny and so on and, and you announce today, hey, where are you going? Yeah, they say, hey, good morning, Kevin. Yeah, yeah, I'm on the fast. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Kevin, you look like, yeah, I'm on the fast. No, he says, no, no. What you do is you go help the poor. Read it. He says in verse 7 of Isaiah 15, it is not to deal thy bread to the hungry, and that thou bring the poor that are cast out of thy house, when thou seest, seest the naked, that thou cover him, and that thou not hide thyself from thine own flesh. What is he saying? He's saying to you, listen, all you're talking about what you're going to eat on this Daniel fast, you only can eat grapes, and you only can eat fruit and, 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 and vegetables. You're only listening, you know. He says to deprive food altogether, and the food that you would have been eating, ensure that somebody else get that. Help the person with their rent, their, whatever it is. You need to go, this is how you initiate. Aside from praying, asking God to clean up your heart, of course. Now he says, once you engage, verse 7, instructions, 
spiritually the bands of wickedness will be broken in verse 6. Uh, uh, he would set the captive free, break the burdens, and break every yoke. Now that the spiritual components is being released from me spiritually, drop down to verse 8. Verse 8 says, then, then me, now that I've followed the rules, now that I've followed the, the, the ordinance and the commands of God, now that I've done that, verse 8 says, now you're going to see some physical things manifest. This is no different from Daniel and Daniel chapter 10. Daniel fasted for 21 days. He ain't seen nothing physically happening. He thought God wasn't hearing him until the angel came on the last day. He says, Daniel, hear me and hear me well. He said, the Lord not only heard you from day one of your fast, he sent me from day one. But I was, I was, I was uh, detained in the second heavens in the spiritual world by the principality of Persia. There was a spiritual being holding me back, another spiritual being, from coming to give you the words of the Lord. So the same thing we're reading in Isaiah 58. He says, while you are following the protocol, the spiritual world is working for you. Heaven is backing you up 1 billion percent, but you can't see it yet. So verse 8 says, now when that has been done, the protocol has been followed in verse 7 of Isaiah 58, which will initiate the breaking of the bondages in verse 6. Then the next step is physical manifestation in verse 8. He says, then shall thy light break forth as the morning. Your understanding, your wisdom will spring forth. Listen to what he says next now. And thine help shall spring forth speedily. All of this because I'm following a fast? No. All of this is because you're following the fast the correct way. I'm talking to somebody. I'm helping somebody today. He says, then shall thy health spring forth speedily. But who is he speaking to? The believers. He's talking to the believers. He's talking to, he ain't talking to the sinners. He isn't talking to the Syrians. He's not talking to the Zodianites. He's not talking to the Canaanites, the Jebusites, the Hittites. These are the people of God. These, this is you and me. But you're bound with sickness. You're bound with, with, with stagnation. You're bound with, with anti-progress and anti-marriage. You're barren. You can't have children. Why? This also, I mean, let me just divert just a little bit. The Bible says even when Abram took on his wife, uh, uh, Sarai, she was barren. Barren wasn't haphazardly. That was a part of the curse. You, you understand? Because, because of the gods that they serve. Because not only was she barren, remember now, Isaac and remember Rebecca had problems having baby. In fact, they didn't have baby till they were 60. But hold on, let's go back. Let's go back some more. Tira, who was the father of Abram, Naor, and Haran, had his first child, Abram, and he was 70 years old. Probably talking to somebody today. See, when you know your stuff, you can talk like me. You talk with boldness. You talk with confidence because you did your homework. And now you're putting the pieces together and you could see why, why this person was supposed to be a Christian and all these bad things happen to them and they're such nice people. Well, I've never read a scripture that says if you're nice, the curse is going to be broken. I've never read that. So the Bible says here now as he begins to come down, he says all these good things that's going to happen to them. Then he dropped to verse 10 again and he's now adding some more instructions very similar to the instructions of verse 7 of Isaiah 58. He says, and if thou draw out thy soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul, that person or those who's frustrated, frustrated in whatever area of their life, he says, these are the people you need to be dealing with during your time of fasting. The afflicted soul, then shall thou, then shall thy light rise in obscurity. So he says, there's another level of spiritual enlightening and revelation that's going to come to you. Not only because you did the first instructions in verse 7, but when you add these additional instructions in verse 10. He says, your light shall rise in obscurity, and thy darkness be as the noonday. Verse 11. And, and the Lord shall guide thee continually. This is because of the second set of instruction. He will guide you continually and satisfy thy soul in drought. So while everybody's stacking up with sardines and all this other stuff, and I'm not saying you shouldn't do that, but what I want you to just know is if you are following this rule, God has an obligation to look out for you. God has an obligation to meet your needs. So he says, he shall satisfy your soul in drought and make fat thy bones, and thou shalt be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose water fail not. Verse 12 is where we will end. And this is where the Lord gave me the revelation as it relates to where you, when you follow this particular fasting, you are spiritually deputized by God Almighty to become the generational 
break up in your family. Verse 12 says, And they that shall be of thee, your family members, shall build the old waste places. What does that mean? How many of you all listen to me right now who have been fighting for property for years, million dollar properties, generation after generation dying out. That property could have been sold, where you all could have gone to school, buy your own homes, live a better life, get your business. And you watch generation after generation die fighting each other for property. All this is crisis, confusion. God says, if you follow this fast, I can bring order. I can bring order where those who was once fighting the property can come together and they will now build the waste places. They will now go forward. But this is the part I want you to get right here. He says, and they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places. Thou shall rise. Listen, thou shall. Who is this thou? You who on this fast. Thou, it says, thou shall rise up. Mm -hmm. That's you, Kevin. The foundations of many generations. And thou shalt be called. Listen what they can call you, Kevin. Thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach. The restorer of the path to dwell in. Now, what does the word breach mean? The word breach means to, to, to break a law or break a code of conduct. So the code of conduct, which was an erroneous one, the generational curses that has programmed the family to fail in various areas of their lives, God says, if you follow this, Kevin, guess what? You will be the repairer of the breach. You're going to be the one that when you pray for your family and tear down those strongholds and break all of those ancestral bloodline. In fact, uh, Leviticus 26 verse 40 says that you must now, Kevin, repent of not just your sins during this. You must repent of the sins, the iniquities and transgressions of your ancestors. But God, they are dead already. Yes, I am very much aware of that. However, when they died, they never made it right. They never renounced the, the evil that they put their hands to in sorcery. As a result of that, this is what is causing the curse to walk through each generation. In the, in the one day of Judah, ten generations later, David and his children catching all kind of hell. But he says, now you must break it by repenting. God says, I'm giving you this opportunity that even though they messed up, even though they did, they can't repent no more. But you could fix it. I'm giving it to you according to Leviticus 26 verse 40. Then he jumped back over there in uh, uh, Matthew 17 verse 21 where Jesus said, This kind of evil will only come with how? Through prayer and who? Fasting. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your wisdom, your knowledge, your understanding. Thank you, Father God, for giving me the wisdom and the ability to articulate your word in such a way that even a child could understand it. I pray, Father God, that you'd amplify the, the, the wisdom of everyone listening to me now, watching me now, and will even watch me in the future. And I pray that this message will take root in their spirit right now and put them in such a position that they can't wait to go on their fast, do it the right way, and come back with fire to break the evil, spiritual, and visible patterns that is securing a failed destiny. I pray, Father God, that every one of the sound of my voice who are a part of faulty foundation, meaning that their, 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 their background is corrupt through evil family members or even themselves, they could be the one planting the seeds now to corrupt unknowingly the future generation. Father, I pray right now that these messages, this teaching, this understanding, which I have laced, not my opinion, everything I have said, I have backed up, with the word of the living God. I have no opinions, and whatever opinion I have will be supporting the word of God. I pray right now, Lord, that you will give them an insatiable desire to say, I can't, I have had enough. I ain't taking this no more. If you did it for Kevin, Father God, if you did it for other people who followed the same rules and has now been catapulted to their destiny, for, Lord, you could do it for me. So, Father, I bind my faith with everyone who truly believe right now, standing on Matthew 18, verse 19, that says, wherever two or more of us touching anything shall ask of the Father in the name of his Son, Jesus, it shall be done unto us. Your word declares, Father God, according to um, John 15, verse 7, and it says that if we abide in you, in you and us, whatsoever we shall ask shall be done unto us. Your word declares uh, in, in Psalms 34, uh, 37 verse 4, and it says, if we delight ourselves in you, Father, you, you, Lord, will give us the desires of our heart. Your word declares according to uh, Proverbs 10 verse 24, and it says that the fear of the wicked shall come upon them. However, 
the desire of the righteous shall be granted. Father, it is our desire that you release us from the invisible cords that has restricted and limited us. We didn't know, Lord. We were ignorant, Lord. We sat under church after church, but Lord, we have never understood this. Thank you for the revelation. Thank you for the insight. Thank you, Father God, for giving us the tools to get out of this pit. Your word declares according to, to Psalms 84 verse 11b. And you promise us, Lord, you said no good thing shall be withheld, restricted, or limited from those that walk uprightly. Father, it is our desire to do it your way. It is our desire to walk uprightly. It is our desire to please you, Father God. No longer are we going to watch our children and our kids be gunned down. And those who are marked for death, those who are marked for destruction, those who, who have a bright future mentally but have no idea that they will be the recipient of multiple children with multiple men. They're going to be the recipient of gunshot to the brain. They're going to be the recipient of cancer. They're going to be the recipient of AIDS. They're going to be the recipient of sugar diabetes. But this is nothing new because it happened to just about everybody else in the family. Father, now we see the light. Now we understand. Thank you for the revelation, Lord. Now give us the, the tenacity. Give us the commitment. Give us the discipline to do it your way because we desire the God kind of results. Father, we bless you, we honor you, we praise you, and we ask these things in Jesus' name, amen and amen. So folks, that is it for me, okay? This is part one of dealing with these generational curses. And like I would have promised you, I'm gonna take you deeper into them. I've done generational curses before, but we're taking it to another level, a real rooted level, so we could just sever these things. So until next week, God spares life, I will uh, be back with you. And before I leave, uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, the next month on the, uh, on I think it's 11 or the 12th or 12th or 13th, I can't remember now, I'm so hot on this message. But you can go on my Facebook page and you will see where I'll be doing a, a I'm a guest speaker at a conference in uh, Dallas, Fort Worth, Texas. So my wife and I will be down there in Texas where we're gonna be dealing with witchcraft, generational curses, marine spirits, and all this other stuff. Myself with uh, the conference host, Dr. Alexis, out of uh, Texas. I'm going there for the second time. And uh, please, you can go online. If you go, I can't remember the website right now. I think it's P-R-O-P-H-E-T-I-C-O-U-T-L-I-E-R-S.com. I think I got that right. Once you go to the website, and then you'll have all of the information where you can register, where you could book your hotel and get a discount, all that other stuff. It's going to be a two-day pack of pure teaching. I've been getting and receiving hundreds of emails from you showing me the proof that you've already got your confirmation and everything. And I will meet you in Dallas, Texas, where we're about to bring the house down with the unadulterated word of God. So until next week, God bless you. <laughs>